animals that have evolved here to grow without any competitors or predators. And when introduced species arrive, invasive species um, can really cause problems to the native and endemic species and can cause species extinction. And that is one of the things that we are trying to um, avoid here. So um, there are several vectors that can transport or introduce um, invasive species. Today, we're just going to talk about marine traffic. Um, marine traffic is a problem worldwide, seeing how trade, transport, tourism increases, more boats, more carrying capacity, etc. cetera. Um, and Galapagos um, receives a lot of marine traffic. Um, some of the reasons are, well, for those of you that don't know, there's actually a, a population here in Galapagos. We have four populated islands and there's around 30,000 people living here. Um, on top of that, on a normal year before COVID, um, we also receive a huge amount of tourists. In 2019, we had over 270,000 tourists visit, visiting the islands. And um, so all these people obviously need food and other um, goods from mainland Ecuador. So there's cargo ships that come on a weekly basis to deliver these goods. And there's also um, small sailing boats that travel around the world that also come and stop in Galapagos um, for tourism or to um, refuel and, and buy goods as well on their way to another um, archipelago. And um, so all these boats, um, the, the risk of, of them arriving is that they bring organisms attached to the hulls, as you can see in these, in these photos. Previously, it was thought the ballast water was um, the higher risk for introduction of, of invasive species. Now um, we know that hull fouling is actually more of a problem. So in order to um, discover what introduced species um, exist here in the Galapagos, we, wanted, we started to assess the biofouling community in um, all the ports of the inhabited islands. In 2015, we teamed up with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center and started using the same methodology that they've been using for several years on both coasts of the United States, the Caribbean and Panama. This methodology consists of um, settlement plates. They're, these are just small PVC plates with a weight on them that get deployed on the, from the floating docks or docks um, in, the, in the islands and are left there for um, several months and then collected. When we collect them, the plates look something like this. And these here you can see um, there's three examples of introduced species that we found on the plates. And these three are known um, to be problematic in other places in, in the world. Um, in 2009, we published um, the, the report of how many species we found over a period of time. And um, we, we reported that um, we found 53 introduced species in the GMR. This is in the, in the ports. Um, 48 of these species were actually newly reported as introduced, and 30 of them were discovered um, from the surveys that we started in 2015. As you can see in the graph, there's um, organisms from lots of different groups, um, ascidians and bryozoans having the largest number of, of individuals. And um, well, this study basically is the greatest reported increase in, in the number of recognized invasions for any tropical site in the world. Now, obviously we want to know not only what is what, what lies in the ports, we are interested about like the, the actual natural environment. So we've started to test for spillover of introduced species from the ports to the natural environment. So we go out and dive expeditions and looking for these species. And unfortunately from the 53 known introduced species to be present in the ports, we have found that 23 of these have actually been dispersed into the natural environment. This can be through the local boats that um, take tourists around the, the islands. And it could also be um, through secondary dispersal with currents, um, et cetera. 
So when we go out and do this, we have um, divers in the water and we do direct searches for targeted species. Um, but we also use the subtitle ecological monitoring methodology, which consists of um, counting and identifying um, three major groups, which are fish, macroinvertebrates, and sessile or organisms. Um, the other big thing in Galapagos regarding invasive species is um, Galapagos is one of the few places in the region and really in the world that actually has a biosecurity agency that controls um, what comes in to Galapagos. In the case of the, of the marine invasives, um, the ABG, the um, biosecurity agency, actually inspects every single boat that comes into the marine reserve. They have divers in the water and they also have a drone that they use um, when divers aren't available. Um, so all boats get inspected. If any um, bow phylon is found on the boats, the boat is asked to leave the marine reserve, get cleaned and then return for another inspection. The Galapagos National Park and the Ecuador Navy um, oversee this process. Um, and there's a, there's a, um, it's known basically that any boat that enters the Galapagos should arrive with a clean hull. Um, basically, um, we, we run with the, the idea of it's a lot better to prevent than to um, deal with a problem later on. So we work very closely with the Ecuadorian government, with the Ministry of of environment um, on prevention, early detection, and rapid response protocols. Um, we also work with the naturalist guides that go around the islands on a weekly basis with tourism um, and local fishermen because they're out there all the time and they 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 can be our eyes. Um, so um, in the Charles Darwin Foundation, one of the big things we do is we um, work with the local authorities to, to help train them um, in diving um, protocols and identification of organisms, collection of organisms, etc. And um, alongside our partners, we also help develop management plans. And we've developed a management plan for the, for, for example, this um, regatta that runs on a yearly basis from mainland Ecuador, where boats come from all over the Pacific and race from mainland Ecuador to Galapagos. Um, now, since we developed this um, plan, all boats have to be inspected in mainland Ecuador before coming to the Galapagos, and that way we minimize the risk of species introduction. Um, then in 2019, we ran an international workshop on marine biosecurity. Uh, we invited people from the United States, Mexico, all the way down to Chile. We had 10 countries, 13 science institutions, 25 government institutions, five NGOs, and a total of 52 participants. Um, the, the big outcome of this um, workshop was that um, we created the first biosecurity network in the Pacific. Because um, basically we know how marine invasions occur. We know also how to prevent them. But the, the big challenge is to actually work together with all the countries um, and MPAs in the region um, to implement a coordinated regional marine biosecurity approach across countries. So if uh, there's an introduction, um, say in Cocos, then there's an alert that goes out and other neighboring countries can also be an alert for the, the species that's, that could cause a problem. And we also do a lot of outreach with the local community, with schools. Um, we do believe that, I mean, like if, you, if people know, if kids learn about in, um, introduction of species from an early age, then there's um, a, a a better chance of them and um, protecting the, the marine environment as well. And um, well, I'm presenting today, but really all the work that we do is a group effort. And there's several of us working together and, and all this exciting stuff in Galapagos. And just to um, finish off, um, Galapagos is always evolving. This is me and my team a couple of days ago up in uh, 
Darwin, and that's Darwin's Arch. And when we left, it was intact. And then a couple of days later, one of my friends was up there and um, took these photos of the arch um, collapse. So just uh, another bit of evidence that Galapagos is always evolving. Um, we've got a bunch of partners, as I've been mentioning, and we've got a lot of donors that make this work possible. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for organizing this uh, ma ma magnificent time. And um, as you all know, my name is Michael Strogoff. I come from a, a small fishing village in the southwest coast of Madagascar. My parents and all my ancestors, they were fisher. So uh, this message was and uh, clear for me uh, that I will be a fisherman too, one day. So I left the school in 2004 uh, as my parents can't afford uh, to provide me a school fee to continue school. So I joined my uncle to go fishing immigration, which is uh, we sail about across all of the uh, coastline of Madagascar to search the best spot to fish. So in two years of this fishing immigration, I can manage um, to kind of manage to save some money and also to buy my own boat and also to buy my own net so that I can work myself and with my crew in my hometown. But during the time where I was fishing in my hometown, the catch was decreasing and decreasing and less and less even we are going to fish far away shore and even deeper sea so and also my brother at the same time working on a conservation side and uh, on the shark and turtle project as i'm a shark fisherman at that time my job was a kind of against to my brother is uh, a point of view to as he helped the community and uh, also uh, giving the community a education like uh, for uh, conservation side. So I decided like not to leave my job, but during the time, uh, there are also a marine uh, local um, management uh, conservation uh, called um, uh, the Lungeki in my hometown, who is supported by um, a British NGO called Blue Volunteers. The Blue Volunteers uh, offer to local people to um, to learn and study about the environment, so that local people can pro like local people can um, uh, protect the environment. So I was the lucky one to get a peek into all the people to join the sc scholarship and learn how to dive and also learn about science and also learn about conservation, about marine conservation. So. I totally enjoy it. And now I'm still carrying on of this knowledge that I have. So in 2014, I held one of the um, environmental filmmaker from England, um, Chris Scarf. He was uh, here in Madagascar filming a documentary on the overfishing for Vice SBO. So at that time, we, we are with the we we travel with the coast guard uh, to doing a patrol around the coastline and also searching those uh, big forno industrial longliner for um, a an, an inspection. So it was a great um, uh, experience for me to go far over sea in the middle of the ocean and uh, jumping in the boat very night time to go to those. Uh, industrial fishing, it was a risk, but it's worth it as experience. So when I was in the boat of those industrial longliner, something that I see there is mind blowing. I didn't really think it was can be like that. The number of the fish they are um, cut, the scale was unbelievable. 
and the no and the, the amount of the gear they use to fish the the, the long line one of the long line have like hundred thousand of uh, hooks it compared to the one I use as a local people so for me I get really my government is put me down that when I was a shark fisherman every time um, the Coast Guard is doing a patrol around the, the coastline of uh, Madagascar I got hassle for small cats that I have but for those industrial uh, fishing boats foreigner fishing boats coming here who fishing and taking everything from Madagascar Ocean and they take away overseas they don't have a problem and even as the local people don't really get benefit from those uh, a foreigner industrial fishing so uh, this one one of the points that I uh, decided like I'm gonna go and it photograph and documenting what uh, is happening into our environment so as I'm an individual it's hard for me to give a voices as might be no one who can not helping, you know, can listening me, but photographing and also documenting people can interested more in the land and see what has happened as the photo also and the documenting is one of evidence. So this is one reason that I am doing my job and helping people to empower people to fight the right for their uh, for new generation, also for their future about our environment. The cool things is that I'm interesting in the field is talking to people about conservation, how to protect our environment, also also make them understand what to what is a good thing to do and what is not supposed to do about our environment. And also, as Madagascar is very unique island, most of everything you see here is, you don't really see anywhere around only here in Madagascar. So it's a good opportunity to film and photograph to show you know, the mag mag magnificent creatures that we have here. But in the ocean, the most I'm really interesting and also really fascinated with filming and photographing a turtle and a whale shark as they are really, really gentle animal. So I am really sad in some other way in the ocean as uh, when I was a shark fisherman, there is no much plastic in the ocean. But as we, as we see now, there is a plastic all over the place. There's a plastic um, ocean poli pollution is not only here in Madagascar, but this is a global problem. In other side, global warming is quite a big impact into our ocean. In the past two years ago, as I live here in a small island called Nusikumba, I only make a two-step. And it goes to the reef. The reef here is uh, all of them is dead because of the globe warming. So we need to work together as a message that I give to everyone. We need to work together and helping and fight to this uh, climate change, globe warming, because this is the right time. If we not fighting now, we are very late. So I am really passionate to my country and also to my people to protect the environment, also to protect, to preserve our culture and also for our heritage. So thank you so much for listening to me and uh, enjoy the rest of your time and help our conservation side. Hello, my name is Dawn Wright. I'm the Chief Scientist of the Environmental Systems Research Institute, or ESRI, and I'm so very pleased to be part of this Ocean Stewards lecture series showcasing various efforts in ocean conservation, exploration, and discovery. 
I was actually inducted as a fellow national into the Explorers Club in 2013, thanks to the nominations of Don Walsh and Sylvia Earle, due in part to several explorations of the deep ocean floor at hydrothermal vents along the East Pacific Rise, and being the first African-American woman to dive to the ocean floor in Alvin. Mm -hmm. But what I'd like to do is to uh, actually take you uh, to the present and to share with you some uh, wonderful ocean stewardship work that we're doing, uh, especially in collaboration with our colleagues here in Southern California at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and many other academic and conservation organizations uh, all along the lines of ocean stewardship. And what you're seeing here is a new global 3D digital ocean called the Ecological Marine Units. And as we zoom in, the cylinders represent data points from NOAA's World Ocean Atlas, 52 million observations globally over a span of 50 years about the primary characteristics that enable life in the ocean. And this extends from the sea surface to the sea floor, involving salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and uh, nutrients. Uh, this is a fantastic project that we are very pleased to continue developing in collaboration with over uh, 10 uh, academic and conservation partners. And the ecological marine units are being used in part for deep marine protected area design and evaluation, as well as for reporting of conditions uh, in zones of coastal and deep ocean governance. And the wonderful thing about the ecological marine units is that it comes in large part from the data of this global Argo float system, uh, the status of which we have built as a dashboard so that uh, the organizations of the world can track uh, what data are coming uh, from these thousands of Argo floats. We've also been very involved in tracking uh, the status of coral reefs, particularly coral reefs at risk of bleaching. And this is a dashboard which was also featured on the BBC's uh, Blue Ocean 2 series, showing coral reef locations and associated vulnerability to bleaching using sea surface temperature uh, measured from satellites and also from some of those uh, floats. We are also involved with the National Center of Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, Conservation International and others in their Ocean Health Index effort. So this is yet another dashboard that helps to track the status of uh, ocean health metrics uh, from all of the coastal countries uh, in the world so that they can see the coastal uh, statistics about how their oceans are changing with time and improving those conditions. We're also very involved with the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation in their Half Earth Project, which tracks conservation progress at the species level and aggregates this information to identify places where additional conservation actions will best contribute to the preservation of biodiversity on land and in the ocean. And to this end, one of the primary goals here is to provide a globally and taxonomically comprehensive mapping of species distribution, distributions for use in conservation uh, planning. We're also very involved in the 30 by 30 effort to protect 30% uh, of nature, again, in the ocean as well, by the year 2030. And we're doing this in association with several partners. Uh, this is focusing on California in this particular slide, showing you uh, the process that we're currently in from assessing the current status of biodiversity all the way to implementing and taking action through a large network of contributors. And ESRI has uh, a very large uh, family of special, of special relationships with conservation organizations, including uh, over 10,000 conservation organizations that we donate our software to. Uh, many of these are ocean conservation, ocean stewardship uh, organizations that we are extremely proud to work with and to build maps and apps and data sets and action-oriented uh, sites for. So this is a wonderful circumstance that's happening right now where we see a global geospatial framework emerging uh, all toward planetary health and certainly towards ocean stewardship. And part of what we try to do at ESRI and part of what I am involved in leveraging as chief scientist 
is the work of our users and our partners in association with this loosely connected network of organizations. And here you see in yellow the many uh, ocean-related uh, ocean stewardship organizations. You'll recognize many of them, including the National Geographic, uh, the United Nations, the Group on Earth Observations, NOAA, several foundations, and more. So what we're trying to do here is to create and share uh, new approaches, new digital experiences in these various areas, especially in global sustainability with the sustainable development goals, with biodiversity conservation, with designing with nature in mind, particularly protected areas and uh, coastal and ocean infrastructures, uh, all with an eye toward keeping an eye on how the planet is progressing. And part of this, a big part of this effort, is our new Living Atlas Indicators of the Planet, which is like a big report card for the entire Earth. And if you go to this URL, the indicators fill up your entire browser window. And we've been very pleased to partner with Microsoft National Geographic and the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network to compile 18 pressing topics affecting our planet with real-time or near real-time data to match including uh, coral bleaching and ocean health. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed this very quick uh, tour of some of the work that I've been involved in in the ocean stewards area. Again, my name is Dawn Wright, Chief Scientist of the Environmental Systems Research Institute, or ESRI, and uh, this is how you can get a hold of me by email or by social media. Thank you very much. Um, you know, part of uh, what we're doing with the Explorers Club by reaching out uh, and pulling in different points of view is to try to expand uh, both the perception of what it means to be an explorer um, and then to expand internally within the club the dialogue of the club of what it means to be us ourselves. Um, and I'm curious with your arc uh, of life as an explorer, and you you talk uh, in in your um, uh, presentation uh, about being a woman, being a person of color, being in the sciences, dealing with uh, um, the meaning of your presence inside this field, uh, what it means uh, to be brought into a discussion like this, uh, to be um, able uh, to put that voice uh, into a forum like this, uh, where we can push uh, these ideas forward. Thank you, Joe. I think it means a great deal uh, because uh, all of us have pursued our, our craft, our, our exploration passion, uh, because we've loved it, because we were curious, uh, because we wanted to try out a new idea or a new technology. And in my case, I've just followed my path. Uh, I wasn't really concerned whether or not I was uh, getting recognition for it or whether uh, whether or not I was a hidden figure. Uh, I, I love that, that film which has been so uh, effective on so many fronts because uh, many of us are, are hidden figures, but it has become much more uh, uh, prescient now that we have these discussions uh, about racial inequity, uh, social injustice, uh, there is the discussion about how uh, women and people of color have been uh, treated in science on explorations. Uh, some of us have experienced some of that but have just kept going. But especially now for, for the younger generation who are very much looking for people who indeed look like them to help them uh, get the, uh, the encouragement and the, uh, and the push to move forward on their path. Uh, these kinds of events are very, very important to me now, and I'm very, very happy to be involved, especially since I've been in the Explorers Club as a fellow national since 2013 and, and have been somewhat of a, uh, a hidden figure there or um, my schedule, our schedules have not jived. At any rate, I was just on an Instagram live session last night. Uh, it's a with an organization called Inspires to inspire uh, young black girls uh, in science, and they were saying we have never we've never heard of you. We we had no idea that you'd been to the ocean floor. We had no idea this was possible. We hadn't heard about 
the Polynesian women who, who have done uh, similar similar work. This is just fantastic. So just uh, to, to see you is very significant. So uh, thank you very much again for, for this opportunity. You know, I, uh, I'm from the Hawaiian Islands. I come from an old Portuguese and Portuguese Hawaiian family. I noted that you grew up on Maui. Uh, and, and was this your fascination with the ocean from very, very early life, from just being surrounded by ocean? Absolutely. Uh, as, as you know, uh, being a, a Hawaiian, that, that is life. That is uh, your essence. And uh, you, are, you, you can't go anywhere without seeing the ocean. Uh, I, I was always in the ocean. Uh, I was always fascinated by it, and that coupled with the wonderful world of Disney and uh, the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau every Sunday night at 6 p.m., that did it. <laughs> That's kind of, and so, so let's go to the deep ocean for a second, because I think there is a you know, everybody's eyes right now are on space because of all the technical advancement and very dramatic things that are happening. But we know less about this world that you've uh, explored and particularly to be there, to be down in it uh, must be, um, well, there's several things going on. There's an emotional quality to this. There's a cognitive quality to the things we were talking about a little bit earlier, this notion of knowing where you are and yet not knowing the things about where you are and what that is like to be in such a place. Yes, it's a very interesting discussion that's going on in oceanography now about uh, continuous telepresence, where we now have the technology to have robots go into the deepest parts of the ocean and to send back uh, the videography and the photography. It's cheaper that way, certainly, we can cover more of the vast expanse of, of the ocean that way, which is absolutely necessary because uh, the satellites that can see uh, through space to map other planets uh, cannot do the same thing uh, with our planet because it's a water planet and the satellites cannot see through all of that water to the same level of detail. But there is something indeed about the the visceral experience of actually being there and there's something about the human perception and uh, and our decision making when we are actually in the deep uh, in in my experience it's been in a submersible uh, on the seafloor and as a student I looked at hours and hours and hours of towed camera video of my study area but it was not until I went uh, to that study area a mile and a half deep on the East Pacific rise that I actually, it all clicked for me in terms of, of the, uh, the spatial cognition of what I was seeing, uh, the scale, the depth, the relationship uh, of the different types of rock, uh, lava flows I was looking at, uh, the creatures, all of that uh, clicked. And in terms of us uh, in the submersible, deciding uh, where to go next, uh, based on what we were seeing and what to sample uh, and and how to interpret that there's really something about the human presence and uh, there I would dare say there's a human occupied vehicle movement that is going on in the scientific community because of that we might say the same thing about space we can send any manner of space probes for instance to Mars but we're still talking about sending people to Mars uh, for for various for various reasons because there's something special uh, about about the human presence and the human perception and indeed that emotion. I tend to ask everybody the same question about just so people can get a, a sense of it. Uh, what a great day is like, not necessarily a typical day, but a kind of archetypally great day. What is a great day? Well, a great. Some people would be uh, would be very uh, excited by having all of their scientific objectives reached. That uh, they may have gone down uh, to sample a particular type of rock or to see a particular life form, and if they've seen that, if they've taken the sample, 
uh, if they if they have fulfilled uh, that objective, if they have been able to traverse enough of the ocean floor or the ocean environment uh, to meet that scientific objective, that is a great day because there is uh, the danger there. Uh, the technology can can fail us, uh, as we know, with with all aspects of life, and if everything holds together and all of those objectives are achieved, then that is a great day. For others, uh, especially for me when I went down uh, in the Alvin submersible uh, for the very first time and I was still a graduate student, just being, uh, just experiencing, that was, was a great day. We, uh, I think we fulfilled our scientific objectives. That was actually not the most pressing thing on my mind <laughs> at that moment, but uh, just the, the opportunity to see and to explore. And uh, I do recall now that having been, uh, once, once that initial rush of excitement uh, wore off a little bit and I was doing the work of the science, uh, that, that, was, that, was a that was, there was greatness in that. There's greatness in, in the initial uh, exposure. You mentioned something, you know, this word explore, I often talk about this with other explorers and in the context of this, um, it has two facets to it. It, it comes from Latin. Uh, and in the old days, in the days of the Romans, the explorer was um, basically like a scout, the person who went out ahead, uh, saw what was there and literally shouted back. That's the P-L-O-R part of it shouted back uh, to the group like, hey, there's a river, there's a cliff, go left, go right, I found food. Um, the speaking part, the part of, of turning around back to an audience, back to people who need to hear and saying something about what you've seen, what you have experienced is a big part of exploration. At least half of exploration is reporting. Um, and yet, as you mentioned, there is something I guess you'd say proprioceptic about being in a place, actually being where you are. The, um, and the burden of how to express that, I think, is very interesting for those of us who speak uh, about exploration, who turn around. I mean, my world is predominantly built around the speaking out part. Um, I'm not a great explorer of remote spaces, but I've spent a lot of my time talking and producing media that compels people to think. Um, so I'm curious about that, um, the speaking part of it, the, 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 the talking to people part of it, the part of it where you turn around to people and you try to get them to understand something that really in a way is an experience, as you say, a spatial experience of the, the way a place is and what that is like for you and how you do it and how you think about it, how you frame what it is you have to say. Well, I think it, it ties uh, very nicely to why we are all here as uh, ocean stewards, because having gone out as scouts, as you, as you framed it so nicely, having explored, having experienced, then the next step for many of us is that these, uh, we, we, we now have a responsibility to protect and to educate and to, to bring some of our uh, excitement uh, to those who are not able to explore. And it also becomes, uh, now our messaging is that we are running out of time really to, to explore. Uh, we have to be protecting uh, at the same time. We know enough uh, about the planet that we do know uh, how much of a crisis the ocean is in. And uh, I think all of us uh, Inti and Maggie and, and Goff, we, we all speak with the, with the same uh, intensity of, of messaging that uh, having explored, uh, we now must uh, be stewards. We must protect this. And this is why, uh, because of what we have seen on our explorations, what we have learned, and what we know of uh, as the implications if we, if we let this uh, be damaged beyond repair. That is a great place to switch over, I think, to Inti. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to switch over to you, Inti, for a second, because I think this, you know, you are a steward 
of an ocean that, unlike the deep, deep ocean, is, is well, it's famous. It's famous, people think about it, they talk about it, the Galapagos are iconic. Um, um, and yet people visualize the Galapagos as this pristine place and all of your work revolves around protecting it from invasion, damage that is happening now. Um, so I'm curious how this notion of stewardship um, and stewardship over a place that is so um, iconically identified with its mythic pristineness, what it is like to try to uh, do that work in the face of a public perception that this is a place of pristine isolation. Yeah, well, um, th thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Um, yeah, living in the Galapagos is an experience on its own. Um, a lot of people that come to Galapagos actually think that the islands aren't inhabited and they are shocked when they walk through town and they see shops and bars and restaurants like in any other island. So that's that's initial shock that a lot of people have. For us that live here, part of being assured of the oceans and I mean, working um, every day and protecting the, this wonderful place is exactly that communicating with the local people. And one, one thing that I mean is amazing and it happens in other islands, not only in Galapagos, is a, a lot of the kids that live here have never been out past the, the local beach and some haven't even been to the beach. So people that live in the islands don't even go to the beach sometimes. So as a steward of the, the conservation of the ocean and Galapagos, part of my job here is to communicate the importance of coral reefs, of rocky reefs, of all the species that um, inhabit the marine ecosystems here and how those marine ecosystems are important for um, problems like climate change, how we need to protect islands from invasion of species that aren't from here, et cetera. So that is part of, the, of our job here in the Galapagos. When you talk about um, climate change in the context of invasive species, I mean, when I imagine invasive species, typically I imagine things that are artificially imported through human agency. Uh, but with climate change, I imagine there is now also a condition in which vectors of ocean flow and currents are simply bringing species uh, that are uh, invasive. Um, that, that strikes me as a much more existential uh, problem uh, for a place like the Galapagos, which exists because of its placement in a specific ocean, um, a specific relationship of current within the ocean. Um, so do you distinguish these two forms of invasive categories from each other? Yes. Um, a lot of the work that I've done um, revolves around um, marine traffic and the actual introduction of species attached to hulls, and that's by human-mediated transport. Um, when we talk about um, climate change and climate-derived um, invasions, as you say, um, it's things that could happen naturally. But the problem is that um, in future scenarios, if, if we don't do anything about climate change, future scenarios can change the way that the currents move naturally. The temperatures will rise, and this will also affect how the ecosystems here work. So, for example, with corals, if um, climate change um, increases and nothing's done about it, some of the corals that in the eastern tropical Pacific will stop feeding the other reefs in the Pacific and will die off because the, the, the coral will end up settling in the deep ocean. And this is when species that normally couldn't arrive to the Galapagos, but because of these, these change of currents and temperatures, they break those barriers that, that previously existed and then can arrive. Now, a lot of species right now, we do get, I mean, when there's El Ninos or La Ninas, we do get species that arrive but that don't st settle. The problem is once they settle and they re reproduce and then they cause a problem with the native species. We do have species that temporarily come in 
and then die off because the conditions aren't right. But with climate change, this could change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Growing up in Hawaii, as I did, I mean, I went through four species of geckos in one lifetime that you would commonly see just from them coming in, eating the other one, replacing it completely, another group coming in, destroying them all, replacing them completely, and yet another group of reptiles coming in, displacing them all and replacing them completely in the span of my life. So when these things happen, they can happen really, really fast. Um, and I don't think, you know, people, people picture this as a gradual thing, but it can really uh, happen very quickly, which then I think for people like yourself, the urgency, conveying the urgency with which this must be dealt with becomes, it's not part of the science, but it's definitely part of the speaking. Um, and to whom are you speaking uh, when you're trying to, I mean, you have, tools, you have locals, and then of course you have, you know, the governments of the world. Where do you focus most of your energy? So, yeah, um, one of the big things with them um, when you're talking about the invasions is you want to prevent the invasion from happening because once it happens, it happens quickly, as you say, and it costs a lot of money to eradicate the species. So we work a lot with the governments here um, and prevention. And the way that we were dealing with um, early detection here is we work with the natural guides here that go around the islands with tourism on a, on a weekly basis. There are eyes, so we can't always be out there every single day of the year, but the guides that go around the islands can. So we work with them. We also give talks on, 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 the, on the cruise ships for tourism, to, tourists to be um, aware of this problem and if they see anything, to report it. We work with fishermen. The local fishermen as well, they're out around the island, sometimes in places where no one goes. So we work with them for them to report if they see anything out of the ordinary. The same with the local community. We work if you go to the beach at the weekend and you see something that's not normal to report it. Um, so we've got an early detection and rapid response network working here in the islands. And part of this is we're trying to expand what, the, what we've done here to the other MPAs in the region, like Cocos, Malpelo, Gorgona, Coiba. And um, a few, well, before the pandemic hit, we ran a workshop here in Galapagos to basically create the first network of biosecurity, because it's one thing to um, work just like us in Galapagos, work on biosecurity. But that's not enough. We need to work together as a region and, I mean, as the Pacific and then further out um, to prevent invasions. It's, it's no use working alone. It needs to be a team effort. Biosecurity is not a phrase I had heard before, but I like the framing of it. Um, I wanted to come back around to tourism the whole issue of a celebrity ecosystem, tourism, the desire of people to be within this system, the desire of people to be within that system in a way that replicates this, frankly, colonialist notion of being in this pristine place where in a sense nobody is, that's a whole bag of things to talk about. Um, capitalism and the desire for businesses to grow, tourism, growth and this whole consumption of the i don't want to use the word commodity because it's exactly the wrong word to use but we come across with many of the discussions we've had here this notion with people involved in conservation that somehow there's this idea that nature is supposed to pay for itself nature has some weird obligation to pay for its existence by yielding some kind of profit um, and tourism is one of the vehicles by which undisturbed nature is supposed to be able to pay for itself. But in fact, in a place like this, tourism itself can become a, 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 a damaging pressure on the environment. So where, how do you manage this? You're leveraging the popularity and celebrity of the Galapagos because it will get attention. People will pay attention. They hear the Galapagos, they'll pay attention. And yet that attention itself can become a liability with this desire to be in this place. I mean, again, I grew up in Hawaii. Everybody wants to live there. Now they do. 
Um, so it isn't the place they wanted to live in when all those people weren't there. Um, so how does that work for you and how are you managing that dynamic uh, in the context of the Galapagos? Yeah, so I mean, tourism in Galapagos was going steadily up until um, 2019. 2019, we had over 270,000 tourists visiting the islands. Then um, the pandemic hit, and I believe it was, we had 72,000 more or less that visited the island last year. And now with people getting vaccinated, and uh, well, here in the Galapagos, by the end of the month, we're, we're all going to be vaccinated, so we're going to be friendly island to visit, tourism is coming back. Now, um, I think it's going to take a long time to get back to the numbers that we had in 2019. And back in 2019, there was lots of uh, conversation about how, how, how many tourists can we actually accept with, before it causes a problem. So there's, there's already been those discussions started with the Galapagos National Park who regulates um, how many visitors enter the, the national park on a yearly basis. Um, another thing to, to consider is um, the amount of people that live in the island, as uh, I think I mentioned, there was um, just over 30,000 in four of the inhabited islands. But the majority of Galapagos is a national park, so it is protected. And like the tourists that do come here, come under strict regulations, they, they have to have a guide and they go to certain places that are well managed. And there's a, a, a carrying capacity for each site. So, I mean, if there's a boat of 16 passengers, one, one site might be able to take four, four of those boats in one day. If there's a bigger boat of 80 passengers, then it would only be that boat and those passengers visiting that site at that time. So there, there are um, protocols put in place um, to protect the, the, the visiting sites. There's um, a number of visiting sites, both marine and terrestrial, that are very well managed. Um, but there is the conversation, as I said, um, how many tourists can we actually allow in? In other uh, places in the world, there's a maximum. Here in Galapagos, we haven't got to that maximum yet. And it's definitely something that has to be considered to be able to protect this place in the long run. Well, yeah. Yes, as, as those numbers go up, in order to manage them, there's a certain amount of distance, artificiality, control, that isn't necessarily part of the appeal uh, of being in the place. It becomes a and, almost a self-leveling thing. And as, I mean, tourism increases, then you've got more boats that have to come with more goods, which also um, increases the, the risk of introduced species. There's more uh, garbage. There's other problems and that come with it as well. So I have to ask you about a typical but great day. What is a great day? Well, um, I agree with what Don said. The, the best day when you're out exploring and doing science is achieving your, your goal, what you went out there to do. Um, but in... In my case is, I would say, achieve, achieving the goal, but being up in Darwin and Wolf and having hammerheads swim past you and whale sharks swim past you while you're like looking for like evil introduced species. That's a good day in my books. Um, so I'm curious with Goff about this notion of um, started out as a fisherman. Inti had mentioned the intimate knowledge that um, the local fishermen have of the ocean in a way that scientists sometimes don't, they see it differently. Um, and how that experience of going from a fisherman to a conservation activist, how your experience as being a fisherman where, where uh, from the bio where you started informs the work that you do now. So for my experience from the beginning of where I started, I was uh, wild don't know anything i wanted to go is like you know make money hunt make money and hunt make money and hunt to support myself and also support my family but as i have some education uh, from uh, through other people especially with a foreigner who is coming to my country who 
tells uh, the local people the right way to preserve uh, in a long term way to to have the resources for other new generation also and also for that you don't need to work hard to make your own living so i also realize in my cats because i as a, as my, as as experience in my vezu side my tribe we fishing today and eat today so which is we don't never save anything but if we do the same thing to the ocean it's actually this foreigner will give us an education is uh, quite makes sense so let's say uh, carry on and do to conserve our own niche resources for our new generation for me it's big tent like from uh, where i actually live from the small village until the states where i where i am it's um I think there's still a lot of things to learn, but so far I can happy to talk to people and also to make other people understand about environments and also to give people voices, how we can do to protect our environment and with our resources. Also to t give them more edu to education, to also to passing on onto their future. For me, it's... Uh, a big huge deal because there are a lot of people in my community as madagascar itself majority of people here is under education for non people to educate and give them the right path to preserve and also about the ocean because we all rely on ocean even people from here in the ground and from a far 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 sea they were all relying on ocean and if that if that is the one reason that we need to protect them for the people who need more and the people who also need to relying from uh, from far sea so as an individual it's very hard for me to give a voices because no one can hear me and no one can listening me because they say oh this guy is being crazy but photos and uh, documenting at the same time will passing in the message to them what's happened now mm -hmm. and what happened if we can provide it for to our new generation. What we going to do if we going to protect it, and as we see what is happening as we facing now. I'm going to come back to this. I want to jump over to Maggie for a second on this whole notion of invasive species, because I noticed um, in some of what you were writing about uh, a, an invasive crab. And I was sort of, you know, I, I personally, I thought Antarctica, the last pristine place. I was surprised uh, that, OK, now there's an invasive crab. Um, is invasive species there are a lot of ships that come and go obviously people come and go has that become an issue in antarctica and does it impact directly on krill populations which of course impact a million other things thank you joe for that question and thank you again for putting this uh this panel discussion together it's great to meet um nt and don and uh, and goff virtually um yes invasives are a global problem. Um, we identified a small invasive, non-native rather, um, alga that could have only come in potentially on like the hull of a ship, whether it be a research vessel or, or the cruise vessels, which are becoming increasingly common along the, at least the Antarctic Peninsula. As far as the crabs and their potential invasiveness, there are deep sea crabs living very deep in Antarctica. I had the opportunity um, to be in a submersible down at a thousand meters and, and saw some of these, these crabs. Um, and it, in a way, it was sort of like um, what, what Dawn was talking about with the robot versus the human presence. The, one of the ways I got into that submersible cruise was have, have had the experience of a number of deep sea photographic cruises. So I too would spend hours and hours just 
oh, just, just a few more images, just a few more images. I mean, it was addicting. I loved looking at these two-dimensional presentations of the sea floor. And the whole point of that was to document the distribution and abundance of these crabs that are very, very deep. And they've probably been there forever, but technology just has not given us the opportunity to see them until recently. Um, the invasive part of these crabs come in when we consider ocean, or, um, ocean warming. Um, the crabs right now are, are limited to the deep sea. It's kind of oxymoronic in a way that it's actually warmer at the bottom of the ocean than it is in the surface waters of Antarctica, which can clearly in the wintertime freeze. Now, crabs have a, a thermal barrier, basically. If it's too cold, they'll, they'll essentially get narcotized and, mm -hmm. and die. Um, so that's why, in part, they're confined to the deep sea. So we, on, on one of our cruises, we uh, discovered that uh, all through the water column in this particular area, there is no thermal barrier mm. all around um, up to 400 meters year round. We had um, data loggers set down at depth. So those crabs could start stair stepping their way up following, you know, the warmer, the warmer water. And the big thing uh, about Antarctica is one, it's very, it's very hard for organisms like snails to make a really heavily calcified shell. Um, it takes a lot of energy. There's, there's, you know, a thermal barrier to that molecular process alone. And there's also, there are no hammerheads. There, there, <laughs> there are no crushing predators, no turtles in Antarctica. So over the millennia that Antarctica has been isolated um, by its thermal boundary, a, a polar current that encircles the continent, um, organisms have not developed not evolved to have heavily armored um, bodies. So those crabs, if they're able to get up into the shallow waters where, where nothing's adapted to protect themselves from those predators, it'll totally rearrange the communities. And it's, 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 it's mind boggling. You look at Antarctica, um, my backdrop behind me, it blue, white, black right? Pretty barren. In some spots, you'll see some grasses. Um, there are two native species of grasses, but on the topic of invasives, there are some species of grass in some areas further north along the Antarctic Peninsula, which points towards South America, um, that are, are invasive. Um, um, but um, uh, where was I going? Sorry. <laughs> um, I lost my well. The the the, the 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 odd island nature of a continent, because of its isolation, even Australia is not isolated in the way that Antarctica is isolated, um, and that just makes its Inti and and uh, Goff and yourself um, deal with a, a certain kind of isolation, which is you know like planar isolation, right? I'm on a map and other things can't get to me. Dawn deals with another kind of isolation, which is just the extraordinary pressure of, of the depth of where the study area is. And yet all these places, all of them, are now be touched by human activity, uh, which brings me back around to this idea of what it means to advocate in a time, in a time of change, really. You know, we're advocating it's different from, say, even 50 years ago, when you're sort of um, cautioning people against action. Those actions have happened. So now uh, there's a different kind of advocacy necessary, almost adaptive to how do we deal with the, the condition. Um, I'm going to go back to Madagascar for a second because, I mean, Madagascar across the country uh, is an example of a place with tremendous 
negative impacts of, of, of human resource extraction, et cetera. And I know you deal, we're, we're here to talk about oceans. You actually um, deal with stuff as well, but um, when you devote the, the energy that you put in to advocacy, the energy, where do you focus it? Is it focused to the local people who, for the most part, there's many of them, they live there, it is theirs, but they have limited power in many cases, or do you focus on NGOs or do you focus on external foreign influences? Where do you focus? So for myself, I'm focusing for local people and empowering them first because they living there they they the one who face the impact so in terms of also i am focusing in like you know for my own self work to put them in a broadcast mm -hmm. so people can see and how we can help those uh, uh, you know the environment you know people lives into a and also everything with it. In one terms, there are so much NGO here doing a lot of uh, conservation and also education. But as if I am local people here, not gonna give voices or help my own people. It's hard for a foreigner investor or a uh, organization to help because people are not well educated or don't understand what will be a bad impact we are talking about like the negative impact all everything happen here is a foreign demand to any amazing creature here all the resources but if the local people who don't understand more about what the resources we have, how important they are, rather than you know giving away to foreigner to come in here, stole like you know kind of like stole let this foreigner stole everything. Even the um, NGO is giving education. It doesn't really work, you know, in between the local by the local people. That I am knowing this what is good for for me and for us all but sometimes there is a miscommunication between NGO and the local people as the language is also it's very hard so this one is i'm focusing it to and people can understand the good and the bad of it because as a, um, um one of our crew says it's hard once everything is wiped out it's hard to bring them back so we have to preserve it in the good way and the fast way before it's too late so i want to come back to something you said you said earlier and you said recently about giving voice and the empowerment of local people and i have found that when people are given voice and when they begin to understand that they can be empowered in one area there's a almost a viral expansion they come to understand how power works they come to understand how a voice works just as you mentioned oh images images seem to work better than just me talking and this increases their power in other fields as well uh, so do you find that your work with local people in conservation creates more of a sense community power, more political power, more social power for the people that are involved so that there is more than just the conservation of resources, but a kind of political change in the people uh, who recognize their own power? So... In my experience, the way in my hometown works in the beginning, so there are 
um, British NGO, and they're also a local community marine management association, which is the British company. The British is supporting them like this, this what to do to prevent from this happen from like ocean resources. But my role when I was working with the British company, I am in between in Forna and Malgasy. So empowering them with association, as you say, it sometimes goes into politically um, and sometimes is empowered to extend the area need to be protect. And also, once they are, as they are at the moment, are understand about conservation and also the politic behind the conservation to preserve it, people as at the moment in my village surrounding area, they can passing on to each other. Where this what is if you want to co come along here this what you have to do and this something you don't need to have to do because you can get having problem with it so there is a politics also in between conservation also education at the same time because here is our resources not in foreign resources we have to protect it because Something that I, when I was working there at the Blue Volunteers and as I was in between um, this British NGO and local people association, something that I have told them like, one day we don't need people to tell us what to do. We know what to do to prevent from what has happened that we have seen so far, the destruction for us ourselves fishing gear method that we use it's not even work but we actually apply but somehow we destroy many things how these are like you know ocean resources collapse we don't need someone else coming here telling us more and more and more we need to provide these there are some someday if the world is collapsed everyone have to fix their own side we need to fix our own side too and that we can also give a hand to someone and not only wait someone to give a hand to us. We have to work together to prevent any mass uh, happening here in, uh, in our country or in around the globe. So, so far, everyone is quite understanding. Even the small kids is understood about conservation and also the politics with it, as we also use uh, the local people and power local people, as I mentioned before, we use it called the local dinner. It's a, it's a local, uh, local law enforcement, which is, uh, this is the politic behind of it. It's for them, but this is not, um, this is not related to the government. So whatever is come people from outside or goes into the area, this is the law you have to follow. If you don't follow this one, we're going to give you fine or we shoot you with what we build here. Because what, what we build here is for us all, but we need to preserve it. If you want a part of the association, a part of the company, feel free and respect what we have, the politics that local people put in place. That's great. I want to come back to Maggie on this issue of voice, because I noticed in your bio talking about women in the sciences, science as a way of seeing. Um, and, and I'm just, it's always surprising to me in a supposedly cognitive, dispassionate enterprise like science that these really ancient perceptual barriers would really exist, but presumably they do exist. And as, as a woman, as as and as as exemplary woman, um, do you do you see that as part of the role that you play in this field um, and this way of seeing that you refer to science as a way of seeing? Does your existence as a woman ex influence that in some way? Uh, and what do you bring as you uh, to this field uh, that you that um, that you think? serves as an example to other young women who might want to be involved in the sciences. Uh, Joe, I think that's 
that's hard for me to answer. Um, I, um, I know from working with young women that whatever it is about me, it, they, they find me a role model. I don't think I do anything special. I, I love what I do. I, I expect people to do their job. Um, and I, I, I have very few people that I do not get along with, especially working in Antarctica. It's got to be a teamwork approach um, in a small remote environment. It's got to be a teamwork approach. Um, you can't be irritated by a little twitch that somebody has. You have to learn to deal with it. And I think for me, having, having spent my career having to deal with situations like that, it just comes second nature to me. Um, and and I am flattered to be considered a role model for that because I don't really think I'm doing anything special other than just um, doing the best that that I can and being being a fair player, being open-minded and trying to be the best, most rigorous scientists, scientists that I can be. I have to give you a moment to just talk about the wonder of krill. Uh, because it's so clear from how we talk about it that it's like the best thing in the world. Oh, it, they definitely are for me. Um, short of uh, some two two legged in two legged critters that I know, krill are are the best, the most superb organism in the world. They are beautiful to look at at any stage of their complicated life history. Um, they have to deal with so much in the way of a crazy harsh environment where it's all all sunlight and then all darkness. And hey, I'm basically a vegetarian. What am I gonna do when it goes dark? Um, they feed everything in Antarctica that was so mind boggling when I was in the submersible because every dive we would see krill in the water column and, every, and, and on the bottom as well. But I was so dismayed to see how many more. I knew the penguins and whales and seals were, were big predators. But little fish would go and gulp them. Even, even some other invertebrates would, would ensnare them with, you know, bear trap claws or sticky tentacles or something. Krill just don't stand a chance down there. But yet they're so successful and have this suite of adaptations and, and so many more, I'm sure, that we're not aware of um, to, 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 to conquer and, and survive. So what's not to love about, about something like that? I also, I'm gonna come back to golf on this too, but I have to have you describe what the best day is. What is the best day? <laughs> My best day. Okay. Oh, wait, oh. after, you'll come next, Guff. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to have to give a multi, multiple answer too. Um, certainly, when I'm in Antarctica, uh, my 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 best day is um, since since we do a lot of diving for our work um, to have the number of uh, uh, descents equal the number of ascents among the dive team. Um, one of one of my recent field expeditions great day was we did a dive survey along the length of the Antarctic Peninsula. Often, pretty much every place we dove, as far as we know, no human had dove there before. Um, so we were literally scouting and, and certainly exploring. So any of those, ev every dive that in, in that in that suite were, were just fantastic. Wow, this is great. No one's ever been here. No one's ever seen this before. How much better can it get? You know, it was like going, going to the moon or going to Mars. No one had ever seen it before. Um, it's hard, hard not to have a great day in Antarctica. And, and also one of the really fun things is 
graduate students cycle in and out of the projects as they're supposed to, right? Um, and it's so fun taking a new student down for the first time because you get to see Antarctica all over again through their eyes. Not to say you become jaded, but you become, you, you kind of forget how, oh yeah, I had that same experience when I saw my first iceberg um, or, you know, the, the, the nonstop giggles when you first see your penguins. Um, so impossible not to have a great day in Antarctica. Great. And Goff, what is a great day? Uh, Madagascar is a very special place. For, for not to have a great day here, that's a lie. <laughs> so, <laughs> so great day for me is uh, that I can film and get everything that I needed in one day. Not have failing equipment. That is a great day. Not missed everything that I needed, my goal, achieving all my goal as I'm going to the field. That for me, great day. As there are few parts, there are two parts because I worked with the, like in the ocean and also working surrounding people with a lot of happy people around me. That is a great day because we need more happy people than unhealthy people mm -hmm. so yeah as i say like madagascar is have a, a lot of beautiful places creatures in very uh almost uh, every animal plant here is unique so to have seen one species of it that is a great day for me seeing discover a new species or that you rare species that you nobody seen a very often that's a great day for me. That's great. Um, now, normally, I also ask everybody, uh, but you know, today I'm just going to ask you two. Um, you know, the Explorers 50 initiative is a very deliberate initiative to try to uh, recognize and elevate, call attention to, include people in a conversation, um, not only with the club but with each other. And, and so I'm curious what your hopes are for uh, the possibilities raised uh, by the Explorers 50 um, initiative and what hope you might have for the future based on uh, what we are trying to do. And I'll start with Maggie. Joe, I would like with my EC50 platform to, um, to sort of help along with all the other EC50 members, um, debunk the myth of the scientist. Um, especially now, I, there's so much confusion over the science of COVID and the science behind mask wearing or not mask wearing. And, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there about how science works, basically. And and we need to improve our education, early educational systems to include a more thoughtful approach to the world, a more logical approach to the world, rather than, you know, just, okay, here's your textbook, you learn this. Because science, science is evolving on a daily basis. You really can't have an up-to-date textbook, right? Um, and, I, and, and, and I think that gets lost somewhere in translation as it, folks pro progress through education. We're, we're constantly learning. It, it really should be lifelong learning um, because there's always something new out there to learn, always something new to explore, uh, whether it be the sciences or the arts or whatever. Um, so that's what I would hope the EC50 brings to the world. I know the Explorers Club reaches so many corners of the world and, and the membership is huge. Um, and to show that there are multiple ways to explore, explore in your own backyard. You don't have to, to, you know, to mount the highest peak in Colorado or wherever. 
um, I would love to, to, to travel to Madagascar <laughs> um, to explore there. Um, but, but there's so much of my home state of Alabama that I have yet to explore and discover. And I think that's one thing that the EC50 program can really promote is, is the ways in which the world can be explored um, and, and the many facets that, of the world that can be explored. The, the art of science, the science of science, the science of art, um, it, it, it all really goes together. You just have to open your perception. You have to manage your perception. But what? And uh, Goff, what are your hopes yep. for uh, this involvement? So for me, for me, for my host for this involvement, I I want uh, the Explore Club to explore more um, as we so far, we, we are in international, you know, we are, you know, in all over the place, but only few people who knows that Explore Club is exist, the 50 Explore Club exists. So for myself, I spoke to my friend and colleague who actually, um, you know, being help in the corner of the globe and the you know the country so there is a, a 50 clubs who actually can you know explore everything and tell people like you know your voices can be a dedication for other people also and we can share what is on your side and what is my side so what i what i meant is we need to extend more in a education way, we, as uh, Maggie say, in more science, you don't need like to give uh, someone like, you know, okay, here go book and study. We have to like, you know, bring it into the field and giving people more in education, what is you here for and uh, what is you doing for? And that will give the other people also a thinking what need to, you know, to wh where this direction of the ship will go. And uh, as, as I said in the beginning, there are so much things to learn, but Explore Club also can want a part of it, like, you know, to give education to other people. There is, we are exploring every day in, new day is a new exploration day new day exploration day but if we do the same thing new day is education day new day education day so far i got more relation from you guys as having you and that those are passing through to someone and that are someone around me i have been tell someone about you know the space ship about like you know deep water with uh, uh diving very very deep and it's like this something exists and we have to learn for it. And uh, as like place where I am, it's hard to access an internet. But if the Explore Club is an easy way to access, people can read and this is what is happening in this corner of the world. And this is what happened in the corner of this Antarctica example. People can have like the way the view okay, this is what we have in this planet. So this is something that I can explore more also to help other people. Great. Well, I've kept you, I think, a little bit over. So thank you so, so much for uh, all the time. Thank you for the work that you are doing in your field, uh, in your local places and for the planet. And very much thank you for bringing what you bring to the Explorers Club to make it a richer place for all of us. Thank you very much. How terrific was that? Unfortunately, every great story and expedition has to come to an end, but it doesn't have to come to an end for you because we have a next installment of the Explorers Club 50 speaker series. I'll see you then.